welcome, uh, dear friends. It is uh, wonderful to see you uh, here. Uh, our conference on the Jewish Gospels is, uh, is beginning finally. Thank you uh, for your patience. Um, I, I was watching folks slowly uh, trickling in and uh, many people are signing in. And so I gave you folks a little time to, to get going. So let's go ahead and, and begin. What is it that we will discuss uh, today? We will um, cover three major topics. Um, we're going to talk about definitions for the Jewish Gospels. And this is very important as we begin. Um, when we say Jewish Gospels, what do we mean by that? Then we're going to go over clear examples from the Gospels about their Jewishness. And I will try to pull material from all four Gospels. Uh, there is an opinion out there that says that, and you probably have heard that many times yourself, um, people would say that the Gospel of Matthew is the most Jewish of all the Gospels. Uh, to me, and I say this with uh, all due respect, this is a completely nonsensical statement. I, I hope to argue, and you, of course, will be the judge uh, of this, that all four Gospels are, in fact, Jewish. Now, what it means and what it doesn't mean, we will talk about in the, in the first part, in the definitions. Then I'm going to cover about how Israel Bible Center will help. So let us begin and get going. Now, by the way, this is how our interaction will take place. Now, as I present material that I uh, prepared for you, if I've done my, uh, my job, uh, you will have questions. Some of you, uh, some of your wills will be turning. You'll be thinking, you would be challenged, you would be perhaps concerned about some ideas. Look, everything needs to be pl uh, put to the test. After all, we're all, we're all called in the New Testament scriptures to be like the Berean Jews who tested everything that Apostle Paul was saying to them. And then um, perhaps you will have an idea, something that uh, you want to give as a feedback on chat and in questions. Jewish Gospels, what is it and what it is not? Judaism is a relatively modern term used to define and describe the religious life of the people of Israel. Today, when we speak of Judaism, we have in mind a certain system of beliefs complemented by religious practices whose development has not come to fruition until sometime between 3rd and 12th centuries of the Common Era, or AD. The rabbinic sages, those responsible, very gradually took the place of Jewish priests, or Kohanim, as the undisputed leaders of the Jewish community. What we call religion today, such as Judaism, did not exist as a separate sphere of life or a category in the days of Jesus. All life activities in which Israel as people engaged, business, art, sex, food, politics, sport, or anything else were intermingled. When Josephus Flavius, first century, um, first century um, historian, wrote about culture, history, language, and beliefs of his beloved Jewish people, he did not mention the word Judaism, not even once. Can you imagine, and I think you need to ask yourself this question, can you imagine that someone today writing about Jewish people would do the same? 
Is it even possible? And of course, it is not possible. And what it tells us is that in the ancient times, uh, Judaism, the few times that it was mentioned, means something else. And today we have developed a new um, category, a new meaning that did not quite exist in the ancient times. The concept of religion and the name given to a religious system, Judaism, is a much later development. The few times when it comes up in the Bible and other early Jewish sources, it describes not a religion, but a holistic way of life associated with the Jewish people. But the way of living was not uniform, not strictly spelled out or clearly defined in the first century. And that's really the century that we are most concentrated upon. Israel's beliefs and practices were diverse and what was deemed Jewish was brought. The Jewish followers of Messiah Jesus or Yeshua were a part of ancient Judaism, or better put, Judaisms of that day. The Gospels, therefore, should be seen as Jewish not because they fit into later rabbinic Judaism, although there's certainly a connection, but because they constantly display Jewish ideas, ethics, values, I should add here stories, teachings, methods. All of those things were shared by many first century Jews. Now, we will now turn our attention to a sampling of the very Jewish ideas and the life ways as they can be clearly seen in all four canonical Gospels. We will see that Matthew's Gospel is no more Jewish than other three. In fact, all four Gospels express the same Jewish Christocentric experience. Now, what I'd like to tell you now is that I will make a, a big or even very big announcement in the very end of this presentation. So I encourage you, whatever you do, don't leave until we announce it. All right? Very important. And, the, and I hope you appreciate the pictures I've selected to communicate this idea. Now, I'm a dog person. I'm not a cat person. But I think this, this, uh, this kitty here um, pretty much communicates what is it that I was trying to uh, to communicate to you. So how must we understand relationship between Judaism and Christianity, or better yet, between Judaism or Judaisms and early Jewish Jesus movement? Older um, way to, uh, to, to understand relationship between Judaism and Christianity is um, similar to thinking of a mother and a daughter relationship. So in other words, people would say, oh, I love Old Testament. I love the Judaism because that Judaism was the mother. And with the coming of Christ, with the New Testament, and it's always is connected, Christianity is then the daughter that came from mother called Judaism. In other words, the relationship of Christianity to Judaism is that of a mother and a daughter. But I would submit to you that there is really a better way to look at the relationship between uh, mother, the ancient faith of Israel, not necessarily Judaism as we have, uh, as we call it today, but certainly as the ancient faith of Israel being the mother, and the mother having many children, only some of which I actually uh, put here. For example, the Essen or Qumranite Judaism, we're going to be spending um, a good portion of time today speaking about this particular Judaism, since this particular Judaism, in many ways, is more connected with uh, the stories of the gospel than perhaps many other Judaisms. Sadducee Judaism, we of course meet Sadducee um, Jews in the Gospels, Pharisee Judaism, boy do we meet a lot of that. 
military or zealot Judaism, you know, the ISIS, the Al-Qaeda, the Israeli far-right wing, Kahanist party kind of, kind of Judaism, Hellenistic Judaism, uh, the kind of Judaism in many ways that uh, Apostle Paul belonged to, uh, Jesus' Judaism, there's more to be said, obviously, about that, but this is the, the Christocentric, Yeshua-based, Yeshua-centered uh, Judaism. Samaritan Israelites, I can't go into much detail. We cover each one of these uh, Israelite movements in depth in our uh, courses. But in, in Samaritan Israelites, let me just say this, is that uh, we were taught all along that Samaritan Israelites were the mixed group of people, that they were something between the Jews and Gentiles. But that's not so, actually, historically speaking. Samaritan Israelites represent very much uh, one of the siblings of this Israelite mother. And from their standpoint, they are the, they are the true Israel. They call themselves the Pnei Israel, or the children of Israel. Now, I also included here the Elephantine Judaism. Elephantine Judaism is connected with a name in Egyptian uh, island of Elephantine, where there was a Jewish mercenary colony with its own temple, temple that was um, uh, that was uh, in rivalry with the Jerusalem temple then probably there was also uh, a Judaism, uh, not probably, there was, it just needs to be, we need to call it somehow, the Judaism of the people of the land. That comes up in rabbinic writings. It comes up with the, with the, when the Gospels describe the people in the land and the crowds and what is it that they practice. And that uh, wonderful lady in the top left, I uh, put her there and called it unknown Judaism simply because um, there, there, there probably were a lot more. And these are the only ones that actually survived to us throughout the pages of history, in the writings, in the archeology, span but it does not mean that the, the children of the mother Israel, that these were the only ones. And of course, then the relationship between the early Jewish Jesus movement, not so much Christianity, Christianity really should be traced more like to the beginning of the second century of the common era, not so much to the New Testament, which is the uh, first century. But in any case, Jesus movement, uh, G Jewish Jesus movement comes directly from the, uh, from the mother that is ancient face of Israel. Um, uh, rabbinic, all rabbinic movements come directly from, from the, um, in some connection, sometimes suppositional connection, but still connection to the Pharisaic Judaism. Uh, there are some questions about Karaites, whether they came from the Sadducean Judaism or not, and certainly Samaritans that are in existence today. So those are the children that stuck around. All right. Now, let me just give you a very, very brief introduction to, the, uh, to who the Essenes were and the Qumran, the idea of the Qumran. The Masada is here, all right? Jerusalem is here. This com Qumran compound, the people are debating back and forth as what this was all about. The basic um, consensus behind this even though there's other possibilities as well, is that Qumran uh, was at the headquarters of a much larger Essene, Jewish Essene movement. Um, and many times Essenes are actually, through descriptions, uh, mentioned in the Gospels, uh, but not by the name uh, that Josephus calls them. Uh, they basically are described and not called by a particular name, like the Pharisees. So uh, it is very possible that, uh, that the Qumran community that was, I believe, under 200 people or so, was the headquarters of that nationwide uh, movement of the, of the scenes. Here you could see some of the pictures for surviving walls of the Qumran compound. This, these are ritual baths, and the Qumran is full of ritual baths, and we will, uh, we will see probably why uh, the ritual baths 
this baptisms, if you would, multiple baptisms were so important in the Jewish uh, water ceremonies of the first century. Now, if you're thinking that perhaps um, this, those were the ceremonial ideas of the past, think again. This picture I took, uh, let's see, maybe three or four, um, three or four days ago. It was a member of our extended family that passed away. And I was there at the, at the cemetery. And so uh, this, this is just a building, administrational building. A little bit to the left uh, there, there's another building where, uh, you know, the, uh, where the burial procession began. Uh, this particular thing here is basically the blessing upon the, the cemetery, okay? So that uh, I won't be translating all of that for you here. But here's an interesting thing. It says here, Shirutim, which is the bathrooms, Le Kohanim, which is the priests, Bilvad, alone. So the bathrooms only for the priests. Now remember that there is, there are no priests today from the standpoint of actually carrying out priestly duty in Jerusalem temple, all right? And um, priests are not the rabbis. In other words, a rabbi hypothetically could be of a priestly Levitical, uh, Levitical and then priestly uh, lineage, but not necessarily so. So you could see here in the modern Israel, we still observe uh, many of the, of the ceremonial regulations that were put in place in, uh, in the Torah and in the Tanakh. Those of you who were in Israel many times, you were uh, probably uh, uh, puzzled as to why most of the restaurants, in other words, if they're not Arab restaurants, if they're not Arab Christian or Arab Muslim restaurants, or Russian restaurants, uh, that they're generally not very really religious. Uh, most of the restaurants in Israel, why they have in the bathrooms this particular cup with two handles. Now, the cup with two handles is basically referred to in Mark chapter 7 when um, Jesus' disciples uh, had controversy with, um, uh, with Pharisees about the washing of the hands. Now, I'm not going to go anywhere deeper right now into what that conflict was all about. We have a fantastic uh, course about that. And for anyone that would like further study, this is where we really go in in the Mark chapter 7 and incredible things emerge from there. So I would very much encourage for you to look at this. But for now, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to show you some correlations uh, really selective correlations. Uh, by the way, I'm hoping that you're writing down your questions and typing them because uh, as I speak, my colleague is looking through them and he will then appear on the video together with me at the time of Q&A and he will read out some of the questions that he would select for everyone to, uh, uh, to, to hear the answer to, all right? So here's the interesting thing about this group of people um, that, that are called Essenes by Josephus Flavius. Now, in Luke 22, we read, and in the same way he took the cup, very familiar text, right? After they had eaten, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Now, most of us, of course, know the connection between this text and Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33. Uh, there's nothing new I'm really going to say here in the sense that, that, that this is, it, it has the Jewish origin. Of course, it's not unique to New Testament because it is really um, Yeshua's claim that in his ministry, in his done and what will be done uh, ministry, uh, will, uh, it, it, it is a fulfillment, partial or full, depending how to look at this, of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33. But this is not what, this is not what I'm referring to here. What I'm referring to here is that in the Damascus document, in the Qumran scrolls, presumably the scrolls that belong, collection maybe an interdenominational collection of scroll, the scrolls that perhaps that belong to the uh, Qumran uh, Essene community. There is a document there that speaks also of the New Covenant, and this is just one 
one short portion to show you that they too thought that God made a new covenant with them to observe the Sabbath according to its true meaning and the feasts and the day of the fast according to the utterances of them who entered into the new covenant to love each other, his brothers, himself, and to strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy and the stranger. Now, here's another thing. In uh, Mark 1, we read that, um, that the voice of one crying in the wilderness, this is, of course, a quotation from Isaiah, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths strength, a straight, um, that this quotation from Isaiah has to do with John the Baptist, right? In other words, when the Gospels speak about these quotations, everywhere throughout the Gospels are referring to Yohanan Amadbil, to John the Baptist. But actually, in a very interesting way, the Qumran Essen community was convinced that they were the voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. And this is very interesting because in Hebrew, it doesn't say that this is the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. It just says the voice calling, crying in the wilderness. And in Hebrew, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness or the voice just in general crying in the wilderness is spelled the same way. Now, the New Testament in Judeo-Greek, as it's written, as the Gospels put it, they already make a, a translation decision of the Isaiah text, applying it to John the Baptist. But parallel to the Jesus movement, to the John the Baptist and Jesus movement, I should say in this case, there are also the Jewish Essenes that are not connected with Jesus, and yet, they're using almost all of the same terminology, like the New Testament, and like this one. They shall separate from the habitations of ungodly men, and they shall go into the wilderness to prepare the way of him. As it is written, prepare in the wilderness the way. Make straight in the desert a path for our God. This is the study of the Torah, which he commanded by the hand of Moses and the prophets have revealed by his Holy Spirit. Now, this is another thing, actually, that connects the Essene community with the Jewish Jesus movement. Now, here's, folks, what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the Jewish Jesus movement and the Essene community is one and the same thing. No, absolutely not. But there was some kind of connection that, in a way that, uh, that was more potent that any other connection to any other Jewish group that we are aware of. And here's a case in point, Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit. It is all over New Testament, Holy Spirit this and Holy Spirit that, and by the Holy Spirit. And, and when you start asking the question, did people in the Hebrew Bible, or what the Christians call the Old Testament, uh, or did people in rabbinic, Jewish sections, if you would, uh, areas, did they, uh, did they use this kind of terminology? Did they use the terminology, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh? And the answer is no. In other words, almost nobody other than New Testament uses the terminology Holy Spirit. The only other Jewish group, uh, the only other body of Jewish literature where we find this, not even in Hebrew Bible, of course, there's Spirit of God. Of course, the Holy Spirit was there, so to speak, in the Hebrew Bible as well, in Genesis and on. I don't doubt this, but as a technical term, Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit, it's missing. Okay, it's missing. It's maybe mentioned once in the Hebrew Bible <clears throat> as a, as a, in a very peripheral way. And all of a sudden, you have to ask yourself the question, how, how is it that in the New Testament, this is already a term that everyone seems to be using as, as, as a lingo, almost. Now, by the way, before I get to the next point, 
it is very, very curious also another point of connection. Now there's other, there's dissimilarities as well. Certainly Jewish Jesus movement and the Essenes are uh, disagreeing sharply on all kinds of issues, okay? Including the nations, by the way, including Gentiles, by the way. This is one sharp area of disagreement. But other than that, let me just mention one more thing that I, that I didn't mention in this PowerPoint slide. So, uh, PowerPoint presentation is that uh, the three most quoted books in, in the entire New Testament, uh, in the, uh, forgive me, not the New Testament connection, but in the Gospels, three most quoted Hebrew Bible, Old Testament books are the book of Psalms, the book of Isaiah, and the third one, some of you would know this answer, is the book of Deuteronomy. So Psalms, Isaiah, and Deuteronomy. Now, community of the scribes, remember there were scribes of Pharisees, the Gospels tell us, but there were also other scribes. Community of scribes that worked very, very hard at this Qumran compound was producing many, many um, scrolls. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden away and then 2,000 years discovered um, in, the, what is it, 1948, I believe, um, when they were discovered, some of them uh, in the beginning, and then this treasure hunt continued until almost everything was found. And actually the latest found, I think last year, there was another, another cave uh, found with uh, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. What, what, when people began to, when scholars began to catalog what was found, they were astounded to find that in this collection, in this library, huge library of books, 900 plus different books, of course, more like fragments because most of them didn't survive the 2000 years. Uh, they were very clearly, very, very well you could notice which scrolls were copied more often. And guess what? The book of Psalms, the book of Isaiah, and the book of Deuteronomy. Exactly the three books that the New Testament quotes the most from. And we can see here uh, the idea of the people as the temple. We've been thinking that, uh, that the New Testament um, speaks of this really in a unique way. Apparently not. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Being fitted together is, grow is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, Midrash on the second Samuel, and Midrash, it's, uh, it's like an interpretive, uh, interpretive melody, if you would, uh, a Jewish interpretive melody on particular texts, in this case on Samuel, Second uh, Samuel and the book of Psalm, has this quotation. He commanded that a sanctuary of men be built for himself in order to offer up to him like the smoke of incense in the works of the Torah according to his words of David. This is amazing. There, here we have another Jewish group, another Jewish writing, believing that God is building a new temple, a temple not made of stone, not made of anything else, but of believers and worshipers of God. Here's another, here's another thing that comes up in the Gospel of Luke. You shall name him Jesus or Yeshua. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Now the following quotation is from Aramaic Apocalypse. Affliction will come on earth. He will be called great. Son of God, he will be called. And son of the most high, they will call him. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. He will judge the earth and truth and all will 
make peace. Of course, all of those things are really um, a compilations of a religious imagination, and I'm saying this in a very positive way, prophetic um, compilation of different texts uh, in Daniel and Isaiah um, coming together. But all of this shows us that what we thought was completely unique in the New Testament may actually not be as unique as we thought. In other words, there were other Jews who, independent of Yeshua and Jesus movement, have thought in a very similar ways, look, drinking this water of faith, in a sense, from the same well, uh, breathing the same air of ancient liturgical uh, Jewish traditions coming from the same scripture. Take a look at one more text that I think is very, very interesting. On one occasion, Jesus instructed Peter and John to prepare to celebrate the Passover. You know this text. He said, enter a city and then look for a man carrying a jar of water. By the way, very soon I will, we will be coming up to a Q&A session, session. So uh, I hope that you have first your questions and that uh, my colleague will post them to me shortly. Enter a city, then look for a man carrying a jar of water. Follow him and ask the person in charge to offer hospitality. He will show you a large room. This is, a, this is exactly what happened. Now, if we don't know anything else, we would think that this text, and actually this is normally how this text is used, it, it, that this particular text has in mind to prove the divinity of Jesus. Now, those of you who have read me, you know that um, I do not have a problem with the divinity of Jesus. But this text, folks, has absolutely nothing to do with the divinity of Jesus, as I will show you briefly. Instead, it shows the writers, yes, Gospel of Luke, the one that's supposed to be not even Jewish, from a deep, intense familiarity with the network of Essene poor houses or hostels, where from place to place um, Jewish Essenes were able to travel unhindered, and in those places of hospitality, other Essenes would host them for the period of time. So, first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus preserved descriptions of a, this particular Jewish hospitality network that may help us to understand this passage. Speaking of these scenes, Josephus writes, they have no one certain city, but many of them dwell in every city. And if any of their sect come from other places in every city where they live, <clears throat> I'm shortening this a little bit, one appointed particularly to take care of the strangers and to provide garments and other necessities for them. This is very interesting. So Josephus, and if you read uh, this text, it's a lot, a lot longer text describing it in more detail. But basic idea is that Josephus Flavius gives his testimony about what he knows as, as contemporary to, um, uh, to those events. He, he gives a testimony that he knows about their scenes. And their scenes, they don't um, uh, congregate in one city. In fact, they spread throughout the land of Israel, a network of these poor houses where their scenes are living and laboring on the borders of the towns, uh, taking care of the sick people, taking care of the strangers taking care of the needy people. So I think what you need to do is you need to imagine uh, a diaconal, net, Jewish diaconal network of the first century. Now there is another text. It's actually described what they provide, that they pro would provide almost everything, the clothes and the, uh, the, everything that a traveler may need. And you may remember one other text where 
Jesus in the gospel sends the disciples two by two and says, don't take this, don't take that, don't take. And when you start comparing what is it that Jesus said not to take, you will see that Jesus was somehow, somehow connected with the Essenes. Was he a scene? No. Was he part of it somehow? Was there an overlap? Yes. Was there some kind of uh, familial connection? Yes. Most likely, by the way, Bethany, there was actually two Bethany's at least, but Bethany, uh, where Lazarus dies, where Jesus resurrects Lazarus, may have been actually an Essene poorhouse. Literally, Bethany, Beit Ania, means the house of the poor. Go ahead. All right, I got a few questions. Um, so one of the participants in the conference is asking, Timothy is asking, what are uh, the Jewish groups today versus the chart that you showed us? Yes, the Jewish groups today, you have uh, rabbinic Jews. There is diff different kinds of rabbinic Jews. Uh, you probably know the Orthodox, the conservative, the reform, the ultra-Orthodox. There's different kinds of ultra-Orthodox. But all of those are rabbinic Jews. There's also Karaites, Karaite Jews, very small amount of Jews. Uh, there was once in the Middle Ages, there was actually quite a big amount of Karaites as well. They uh, do not um, accept the authority of the oral law uh, as is accepted in all rabbinical uh, Judaism. You still have um, the Samaritan Israelites still in existence. Notice I don't call them Jews, I call them Israelites. Okay. They still live uh, in Israel and they number maybe between 1,000 and 2,000, I think. And then, of course, uh, the Jewish Jesus movement of today, whether you call them the Jewish Christians, whether you call them Messianic Jews, or whether you call them someone like myself that doesn't know how to call myself, you know, a, follow, a Jewish follower of Yeshua Jesus, um, no matter what the name. But th those would be, I think, the major... Uh, the major groups that are surviving today. All right, excellent. Colleen is asking another question. Um, she is asking, you mentioned that the priests have distinct duties from the rabbis, uh, that, you know, obviously priests serve in the temple, but since there's no temple, what are their duties in modern times? Well, it, it is not so much that they have uh, special duties, but in the synagogue, um, everything basically is divided. There's things in the modern synagogue uh, that only Kohanim can do. In other words, they're called uh, to read certain passages, to pray certain prayers in certain time, and uh, for a particular uh, particular section. So uh, a synagogue today that is not really a descendant of the temple, uh, it's actually a descendant of something else. And in our courses, we actually go into the history of of, uh, synag of how synagogues actually came came about. But in some way, this distinction between um, uh, a Kohen and Israel, that which a uh, rabbi would make very often ask you, are you Israel are you, or are you a Kohen? Or are you a Levite? Um, so in the synagogal service today, which all of this is, is really verbal in many ways, most of it is verbal. Um, different people as part of the liturgy would read and um, take part in the different sections of the synagogue literature. All right, Susan has a question. Um, she says, I understand that the Essenes were uh, expecting the Messiah. Well, why didn't they recognize Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah? Did he not fulfill something for them? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, it is very, very possible that uh, the reason in time we don't really see um, um, a large Essene uh, uh, presence um, is probably because many of them, in fact, did uh, recognize Yeshua, Jesus, as the Messiah. And uh, there is a bit, there is a little bit of a hint uh, that we that we have. Um, um, uh, to that. And that is in the book of Acts, we see uh, a community of Jesus followers who are Jewish Jew, Jews, Jewish community of Jesus followers, leaving the kind of lifestyle that is characteristic only of the Essenes. 
They have shared property. They share with one another. And people get into this sort of like, it, it became stylish for a certain period to actually give up your private property, sell it, and bring it to the feet of the apostles. Where in the world are they getting this kind of almost Jewish socialism? This is way before Bernie Sanders, right? So where are they getting this? This particular communal living. And the, where, they, where they're getting this from is actually the most, the only explanation I, I think is a reasonable one is that because the Torah does not speak about establishing such communities, you see? In other words, the Torah does speak about social responsibility to the poor. The Torah tells the people with means to, to not harvest everything they've got, but to be mindful about the poor so that the poor could not receive handouts, but that they would be able to, to work with their own hands and to also harvest the, the, the corners of the field enough for them. And so the Torah teaches to care for the poor, but the Torah does not, the Torah speaks very much in defense of a private property. And so somehow, all of a sudden, in the, in the book of Acts, we have a Jewish Jesus community that represented no doubt only some of the Jews that followed Jesus, is living in this very communal, share it all, lifestyle and it's very interesting that if we we'll turn to Josephus Fumadis and if we turn to other Jewish sources we see that this is actually how the Essenes um, uh, lived. Now um, in one of our courses we speak of a truly truly fascinating idea of the idea actually several of our courses the idea of the um, uh, Jewish teacher of righteousness this teacher of righteousness was uh, 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 the Messiah of sorts. And I'm not going to spoil you a lot, but there is a very good reason to believe that, um, that Menachem the Essene that is mentioned by Josephus Flavius is actually the same person as the teacher of righteousness of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that he was, he lived a, a sort of a double life. And he was a friend at the court of Herod. And he was, but secretly, he was preparing revolution. You could read this in, uh, in the scrolls that there is a war scroll. It's a very militant kind of spiritual, but militant, ready to fight kind of movement. Um, and and so, so this particular person, uh, Menachem the Essene, if, if identification is right, is dies uh, being uh, being being punished. So, in other words, his revolution preparation gets gets found out, and he and he dies, and his body lays uh, lays on the floor of Jerusalem for three days, and you know, uh, not uh, not an honorable burial of any kind. So, it is very possible. It's very possible, actually that the Essenes did find in Yeshua, in another Jewish teacher of righteousness, a way forward for them. All right, another question, perhaps a really quick one. Last one. Yeah, yeah, we, can, we can go for one more. Uh, Jane is asking, um, who were the people of the land? Uh, was that some kind of lower class of Hebrews, or are we talking about some people who were brought through Babylonian exile or from other places? What are we talking about? No, no, no. First of all, first of all, um, we, we're talking. Uh, there is always, there is always in every country, I think, um, in, in every uh, in every nation, there is this uh, rivalry between the center, the capital, and sort of everywhere. So if you look at, um, you know, uh, United States, for example, there is a little bit of a rivalry between the, you know, like let's say the California, you know. Um, uh, New York, for example, Washington, right, for, and let's say in America, okay? So it's that kind of, that kind of difference. Remember that uh, how Jesus chose to um, uh, approach this, the, the Judeans, 
uh, around Jerusalem, and, and if you visit uh, Israel, you will know that Jerusalem is pretty high up in the mountains. And so people that are living there, they feel that they're actually um, topographically higher than uh, those who are living at the bottom, okay? So the Galilee is much, much, much lower. Uh, everything else, actually, including Galilee, uh, is much lower topographically than uh, the heights of Jerusalem. And it's very interesting that Jesus uh, says to, to the Jews of Jerusalem, he says, you are from below and I am from above. Only if you realize the topography of Israel, you understand what kind of play on words that he's engaging here. It's very interesting. So basically the people of the land, uh, they were not the sort of the uh, card carrying members of the people of the land Judaism. But they were a group of, pe a group of people um, that was not organized and yet that had a Judaism of their own. Very often, Jesus, uh, Jesus' views align in many ways with the people of the land that whom a later rabbinic class had thought as not educated enough because in the end they didn't follow the rabbinic sages to a, to a, to the greatest degree in other words if you want to find out some kind of truthful information about anybody don't ask that person's enemy okay and the problem is that the few things we know about the people of the land we know from the rabbinic sources the people of the land uh were basically uh those away from the religious centers, but not necessarily uneducated in the Jewish matters. They simply had a different um, ideas about their Judaism. So let us go ahead and, and continue, and then we'll start for more Q&A sessions. I hope that uh, you enjoy in it, and I hope that you, will, you may come up with some more uh, questions. All right. Let's go to Matthew. Let's take a look at how Matthew, and of course we all know that Matthew is the most Jewish of all the, of the Gospels, but here you are, a couple of really great examples. Uh, this is a, a genealogy of uh, Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and of course this is very Jewish, this is obvious, but take a look what he's doing, starting with starting verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And then, from, and from the deportations to Babylon, to the, uh, to Babylon, to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now, why is he, first of all, prior, prior to this, there was a very long, one of two genealogies, one in Luke, one in Matthew, of course, as we know, uh, that why did this genealogy was so important? Why was it important for Matthew to show that there is this 14 generations uh, between different uh, sections of Jewish history that involved in the end Jesus the Messiah? Well, Gematria is a Jewish interpretive method, whereas each letter of the Hebrew alphabet's numeric meaning is added up and is compared with other Hebrew words in order to find a deeper encoded meaning. Now, if you like me, you would be reading this um, definition. You would say, oh, this is kind of crazy. This is like south of the border. You know, this is really, this is really strange. I'm not getting into this. Well, I agree with you. I'm also, uh, those of you who know me, I'm not prone to crazy ideas. But um, even I, with my very conservative views, uh, believe it or not, cannot de deny that those kinds of things are conservatively, but are still present in the New Testament. Here's a couple of examples. Here's one. The numeric value of the Hebrew characters forming the name David. This is how it's spelled in Hebrew. Dalet, Vav, Dalet. The great king of Israel is 14. Here's how it works. Dalet is 4, Vav is 6, and Dalet is 4 again. And what do you get if you studied the same math as I did? 14. Thus, Matthew 
into Wolf's gematria and genealogy to tie Jesus to David three times through the number 14. David, David, David. And of course, we know that the Gospel of Matthew is all about the kingship, the kingdom, the Davidic kingdom, and the Davidic kingdom as it's fulfilled in Christ Jesus. His point is that Yeshua is the ultimate son of David. Jews have been waiting for. Now, of course, there is a very famous example of Gematria also in the in the 666 that appears in the book of Revelation, 666, and to the best uh, of calculations that I that I have seen, is that it matches to the name of a Hebrew spelling of a name of Neron Kisar, Caesar Nero. If you spell it in Hebrew, you and you add up every single um, uh, letter, you come up to the 666. Now, there is a minority manuscripts that have not 666, but 616. And the very best explanation to this is that at some point, a scribe uh, decided that people don't know him by Neron Kisar, but they know him by slightly different spelling, Nero Kisar. And the numeric value of Nun is 50. So if you take 666, I hope I didn't confuse, uh, I, I didn't confuse you completely. You minus 50 from it, drop one letter, you do come up to 616. Now there is also 152 fish in the Gospel of John, explain also the meaning of that. So I, I think there are clear examples of this Jewish gematria that take place, uh, certainly uh, in the New Testament. Here's another one, also Matthew connected. Of course, the, the, the best uh, way that we know um, the, uh, of Matthew connection is um, the Sermon on the Mount. This is the most famous uh, section of the Gospel of Matthew, if not the entire New Testament. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. And up until really discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, by the way, you could see it over here. I think, um, I think uh, uh, this is actually the sections, section here. You could see Ashrei, Ashrei. This, and, and you can find some others here, here also, Ashrei. So this is the translation. Blessed is the one who speaks with a pure heart and does not slander with his tongue. Blessed are those who adhere to her laws and do not adhere to perverted paths, speaking of wisdom. Blessed are those who rejoice in her and do not burst out in the paths of folly. Blessed are those who search for her with a pure hands and do not pursue her with a treacherous heart. Blessed is the man who attains wisdom and walks in the law or the Torah of the Most High. This is a very good example of the kind of things that we uh, see in the Gospels that we previously thought uh, do not have a Jewish parallel. All right, so let's take maybe three more questions and then we'll have um, a little bit more. Go ahead. Elizabeth is asking, it says, um, were the people who thought of the new covenant uh, that is belonging to them, uh, the Essenes, or were there others? Are there other Jews out there who kind of made references to the new covenant? Um, not that I'm aware of, in the sense that they believe that it already had taken place. But remember that when we, the problem is that when we're dealing with reconstruction of history, we're dealing with plausibilities and probabilities only. And the reason for this is because we don't have the full picture. We have, it's like finding your old puzzle from childhood in your parents' attic. Uh, and then you get all excited, you start putting it together and you realize, oh my gosh, half of it is missing. And you know, really history is, is the puzzle that a lot more than half is missing. And so therefore, those, those are the kinds of things we know about. All right. Um, all right, Chuck, is that a question? What is the difference between the ritual bath, mikvah, and the way that John the Baptist baptized? Uh, was that new idea, John's idea? 
No, there is no difference. There is no difference. It's, it's, it, it is a Jewish uh, mikvah. I think the only possible difference is that mikvahot, that's the, the plural of mikvah, is that uh, generally they were not in running water, so to speak. You know, the mikvahs in Qumran probably were not a, a, a very clean uh, pools of water. In other words, you get the water from the uh, from a limited water supply from rain and from other things that they how they received water there. But uh, John did it uh, in the running water. But I'm not sure it's really that big of a difference in that way. So, um, so by the way, the reason you know that John the Baptist's the baptism was not so-called the new Christian ceremony. Um, is because the entire Judea came out to, to be baptized of John. I mean, how would they do it? I mean, do, should we really imagine every, the old Judea going out to become Christians? Or, of course not. They are go, they're doing, they're participating in a very Jewish ritual. And I think this is the key here. All right. We have another question here. Um, um, William says, Bethany may have been a scene. What is the basis of that claim, quoting May? Uh, is there some uncertainty? Why, why the May statement? The May, yeah, there is, the, the uncertainty is always there, always there. Again, whenever, we, we don't like it this way, uh, but reconstructing history is, uh, is very much to, uh, determined on, on the level of material do we have to prove to prove um, a particular reconstruction. And the May is there is because there's many things that are matching, okay? And you need to take courses to really to really get into this. We, we, we do, I think, fantastic job at, at exploring this. But, but if, even when we do that, it's very important that we always, always allow, and I think this is very important in teaching also, that we allow uh, for whenever it is that we're presenting a very good, very solid opinion, but now opinion that we allow for, for to say, listen, pending additional information, this is what could be reconstructed from this. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, for me, this may is almost certain, but it still is a may. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, continue with the presentation. The resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, John tells the story of the death and subsequent resurrection of Lazarus, whose name means in Hebrew, my God is my, my help, Eleazar. The author warns the reader that what he's about to find, to find out, would not make sense unless the reader would keep in mind that, that Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Remember, it takes place in Bethany. In Bethany. What was the problem exactly? When all personal and communal means were exhausted and Lazarus' health still took a sharp turn for the worst, Mary and Martha thought of the obvious. They must let their now famous miracle working rabbi friend know so that he can come as soon as possible to help Lazarus. After all, Lazarus's name, Eliezer, means God is my help. This is where the stunning detail that I want to bring to your attention occurs. When Jesus got that message, he decided to stay where he was for two more days. If we're reading this text honestly, we would probably not be moved to open a hymnal and sing the famous hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, at this point in the story just yet. We read in Jerusalem Talmud, this is a later body of literature, for the first three days after death, and, and this is really uh, the text that begins to explain to us what actually went on. For the first three days after that, the soul floats, floats above the body, thinking that it will return to the body. When the soul sees the body, 
that the appearance of the face has changed, it leaves the body and goes away. So this is very important. This is, by the way, not the only Jewish reference. There's not a lot of them, but there are some. Uh, there's others also. Uh, the references about Jewish belief in the resurrection from the dead, but Jewish belief in the resurrection from the dead only exclusively within three days. So then the question becomes, on which day did Jesus actually arrive to Bethany, to Bethania? Well, this is the key. He arrived on the day number four, you see, not within the three days. This is why he had to wait for two days. What was the idea? But was this idea present in Jerusalem Temple, third century? And the Jerusalem Talmud, I'm sorry, uh, written at, at the earliest in the third century. There was this idea present in the time of Jesus in the first century. Well, yes, in a fairly recent discovery of an ancient stone found in the same geographic location where some of the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, there is an intriguing phrase that can be translated as in three days live. I, Gabriel, command you. While the resurrection of Lazarus is surely not the event described here, the discovery shows that the idea of resurrection within three days was not a foreign concept to the ancient Jews. Jesus waited for two more days, timing his arrival in such a way that he got to Bethany on the fourth day when the resurrection was no longer possible. Remember that Jesus, as a child and as a youth, lived in the little city called, um, uh, in the little village of Nazareth. Nazareth, Nazareth was um, only about 40 minutes walk or so, maybe an hour walk, uh, to the, uh, another Jewish city, Sephora. I think uh, its uh, Greek name at the time was, uh, if I'm not wrong, Scythopolis. Um, Cyphorus, Cyphorus, I'm sorry, forgive me. Uh, that, was the, that was the regional center. Uh, and uh, no doubt, Jesus being the carpenter builder, in other words, he was a, not a carpenter that makes chairs, he was a carpenter that makes, that builds houses which is why there are so many things about houses and his stories. Um, he worked there in all kinds of house building projects in that, in that town, not far away from Nazareth. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any other place to work, actually. Um, and that particular town housed a, a theater. Up until today, you can, you can see uh, some of the remains of the theater. Perhaps it was later rebuilt, but somewhere there, there was a theater. And this is why most likely you will also find that Jesus is teaching a lot of things, up, theatrical kind of things in a positive way when he speaks about the hypocrites. And this is a theatrical term, changing phases. This is probably also where Jesus had learned uh, the importance of the, of the timing, because in the theater, in the theater, theatrical compositions, timing is, is very, very important. And I think here we see uh, Jesus as a master teacher waiting the two days to arrive on the fourth day to, to show that he will do what is not possible. Why was Jesus late? in order to clearly show that resurrection is not something that he does, but resurrection is something that he is. Now remember to hang on till the very end of the presentation, there will be an unprecedented, well, maybe I shouldn't say unprecedented, but big announcement made. Um, so whatever you do, don't leave now, hang in there, just like that cat, although I'm a dog person, whoever of the dog lovers out there. All right, let me bring, bring this to, uh, uh, give you one last uh, section here. There they crucified him. This comes from John. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, traditionally translated as the uh, uh, King of Judeo or Judeans, 
traditionally translated as the Jews. Many of the Eudaioi, that's the Greek for Judeans, read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Judeans said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Judeans, but rather just say, this man said I'm a king of the Judeans. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And we have one last section and then the big announcement. So go ahead. Right. We have a few questions uh, that come in. Uh, Jerome is asking, he says, do modern day Jews still believe that the soul lingers for three days and where in scripture do they get or derive what they believe? Uh, remember, uh, Jewish, uh, Jews are not um, uh, Christian Protestants. In other words, uh, they do not have the idea that, that uh, only something in the Bible has to be the rule of life of doctrine and life and doctrine. There is no such rule in Judaism. Okay, so you can have things that are not in the Bible, but are in other Jewish sacred books. Okay, um, so that's that's from that standpoint. But whether Jews today still believe that? Well, some Jews certainly do. So, for example, when uh, Peter, when was it? Twenty-five years ago, a Chabad Lubavitch uh, a leader. Uh, Menachem Schneerson was declared uh, by the Chabad Jewish movement to be the Messiah. And then what happened shortly after, he was paralyzed. He was in, uh, in the Brooklyn hospital, paralyzed for, I think, a couple of years, if not. And so at that point, that the, uh, his disciples began to read Isaiah 53 as applying not to the way with Christ followers like, like uh, you and I probably would apply it to, to Jesus, but they applied it to the suffering of this righteous man, as they saw it, as that he was suffering for the sins of the, for the, sins of the world, as Isaiah 53 is describing. And so, and then of course he dies. And then uh, they, they said, okay, but Isaiah 53 also says that he will see the light of life again. So that necessitates, of course, the belief that, that uh, Menachem Schneerson will rise from the dead. So what many of them did, and of course this was a very turbulent time, is they gathered Crown Heights uh, Brooklyn Cemetery and they parked, they stayed, put the tents there, and they literally waited for three days for the resurrection of Schneerson. It never happened. Never happened. But actually, up until today, if you talk with the Chabad uh, you will see that uh, many of them, if not most, believe that he did rise, actually, but he rose uh, in the way Jehovah's Witnesses would speak of the resurrection, in the non-bodily, spiritual way. So it's a long story, but but yes, that's the answer. Go ahead. All Next right. Question. Jim is asking a question, uh, what is exactly meant by the kingdom of God? This is a very loaded question. <laughs> and so he talks about Jesus preaching the kingdom of God and, uh, you know, Philip preached the kingdom of God and so on and so forth. So I'd like to hear from a Jewish perspective, a few thoughts of what, what is this kingdom of God? Well, uh, look, shooting from the hip, I would say the, uh, that the kingdom of God is, is when the will of God is done. Really, in the end. This is when his heart, when his mind is fully obeyed uh, from the heart and from the mind of the human beings uh, in the world. Now, of course, we can go into a lot more details, but for that, you're going to need um, another conference. Okay, and so uh, I, I would say in the end, it comes down to the kind of things that Jesus prayed in the what we call the Lord's Prayer and the kind of things that all Jews pray in the in the most um, sacred of Jewish prayers called the Amidah. Go ahead. All right, another question. Uh, Jesna is asking: Is why are Karaites despised by mainstream Judaism uh, when they go back to God's word, and not human interpretation? Why why such dislike and animosity? Uh, I I don't think there is really that much of this dislike of animosity. They're just not around anymore. You know. Um, when when there was a dislike and animosity, 
uh, look, it's it's always it's always the, it, it always um, an issue who is in charge. You know, who made you in charge? I'm in charge. You no, know, who made it? You know, and then there is a, it's a rivalry. It's a normal, simple reaction of people wanting to to say that whatever my interpretation, I would want to control the community. Really, that's the animosity. I mean, there's there's a lot more reasoning. There's reasoning that rabbinic Jews, no doubt, put a place in why it's so important to have the oral traditions and the oral law, oral Torah, that are put. Uh, and there's reasoning why Karaites. Um, uh, believe that, that no, this is not the other way around. But the fact is that the Karaites lost, and they're no nowhere around. You try to go to the Karaite um, synagogue in, in Jerusalem; uh, it's always closed. I'm sure they get together at some point and, and do worship. I don't know when. I can never s stop that they will be open. You know, there's just there's not animosity today, just because you know they're not really around. They are around, but they're not, but not really. They're not uh, big enough numbers to be seriously considered. I hope I'm not offending any comrades right now that are hearing this. If I do, I apologize. But I was responding to a particular question. Go ahead. There's just there's just not many Karaites around, honestly. I mean, it's just it's not like you just walk around and say, "Hey, there's a Karaite." Uh, that yeah, that they're a very small community. Um, so if somebody's showing hatred to them, that's just you know bad manners. So. Let's put it that way. Uh, all right, uh, Ismail's got a question. Why did Jesus cry before calling Lazarus to life? Uh, was it because he had uh, seen a lack of faith in him or in Mary and, or in Martha? Or, you know, what, what is was the issue here? Uh, actually, the, actually, this is a non. This is an excellent question. It may be more excellent. It's bad English, but it, it's bit, maybe better than most people realize. This is a very important question because in John 11, this is where this whole thing is taking place. Um, Jesus is portrayed, first of all, Lazarus, who is a close friend of Jesus, is portrayed to be dearly loved by the Jews, dearly loved and honored by the Judeans who came to comfort his family, to came to cry with those who cry, to grieve with those who grieve. They came to comfort and to honor the great work that this, that this um, Essene Lazarus and his family most likely in my in my uh, <laughs> reconstruction were doing and um, and when Jesus see in the in the Christian mind there's all kinds of different ways to look at almost any event Christianly and Jewish in the Christian mind when a Christian talks about a burial of another Christian uh, or um, you know uh, of someone dying a Christian tends to speak about celebration celebration of life the christian is very very excited about about somebody dying for some reason now speaking tongue in cheek of course it's not always the case but generally speaking there's this idea that you shouldn't really be grieving because uh, there is a resurrection coming and yes it's true the resurrection is coming i also believe that and yes we should not be grieving as paul said as those without hope but in the Jewish uh, mindset, uh, when someone comes to grieve for someone who is deceased, in the Jewish mindset, dying of a righteous man is a, a very sad um, point in history, in the moment, in time, when the weights of right and wrong, of righteousness and injustice and injustice, righteousness and, and, um, and uh, the opposite of righteousness, are tipped just a little bit in the wrong direction you see so that that's why that's why they're not just crying for show they really are grieving about lazarus who had to help countless amount of poor and needy uh people uh of that of that area and so when jesus came and he saw other jews crying together how could jesus a jew not cry with other jews you see you see, really, and I say this very respectful, the fact that we're not tracking this shows that we're not reading the Gospels Jewishly, and the Gospels are ought to be read Jewishly. These kinds of insights are but a tip of an iceberg of Jewish context and culture relevant for modern Christ followers that God's people need to know. 
This is basically where most people are, and I certainly cannot presume that you're here, but you yourself would actually uh, know this better or not, if you read better than others. If you're reading the scripture and you have the feeling that you came into a movie that's been going on for 40 minutes, you could see what's going on, you could see that some people are running trying to catch somebody, but you, you, you you, you don't really understand what's going on. You feel like something is missing. You feel like uh, you came into a movie too late to grasp, uh, or the same thing could be with reading a book, of course, um, to grasp what is this all about. Then what it is, then you are in the situation that uh, you're looking, um, you, you're seeing just the tip of the iceberg, which is actually good. If you're beginning to see the tip of the iceberg, if you're beginning to know, to realize that there is more to the scriptures of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a lot more and you've got to be missing something in so many different things, then this is, you're already in a good position. Actually, you probably wouldn't sign up to this conference. You probably wouldn't be listening to this discussion for almost an hour and a half. If you were not, uh, if you were already not seeing the tip of the iceberg, but when you take the time and when you register, when you become part of the Israel Bible Center learning community, you will actually going to see that actually what's under the tip of the iceberg. All right. Let me give you some, uh, some, uh, let me give you a tour. Because many of us, including um, uh, Professor Pinchas Shu and I, and many of us, have put our hearts into this school. This is not work for us. This is this is where our hearts are. And let me just challenge you with, with the words of Rabbi Hillel, the grandfather of Rabbi Gamaliel. You remember him, of course, in connection to to Apostle Paul. He said, "Do not say when I have free time." I will study. Perhaps you will never have free time. So much of the iceberg is right here. Let me give you a tour about that. I think only I could really give you. On the website, you see here on the top left, enroll or student login. This is how you get into the student corner. I will show you inside a little bit later what's actually inside of the student corner. This is actually best kept secret. This is not the big announcement, by the way. There'll be, there'll be a real big announcement. But if you go here to courses, you will there will be a drop, uh, drop down menu. You will see a collection of Hebrew Bible courses and the New Testament courses. Some of you are saying, well, I don't know where to start. Well, all you need to do is to click Course Unit 1 or Course Unit 2. Uh, to start Course Unit 1 is, is excellent because you will basically get the number one in series of courses. Now, by the way, number two does not mean that they're more advanced unless it's Hebrew. In, when, if you're studying Hebrew with us, yes, the beginning courses are for very, very, very beginners. People that want to start pronouncing Hebrew, that don't even know the alphabet. Then there's other courses that help those who are already more advanced. That's true. So you cannot take course from unit two and three in Hebrew without taking unit one. But all other courses and the majority of courses are not language courses. They're courses about Jewish culture and history and only such that is relevant to modern Christ followers. So every single course, it does not matter, can be taken in any um, in any order, which is the beauty of a program that we've that we've created. So you can go into New Testament courses, and there will be a large collection displayed of different uh, New Testament courses. For example, if it picked up your interest, if picked up your interest uh, about the scenes. Uh, Professor Bill Hashir taught this course, Shadows of the Scenes in the New Testament. Excellent, excellent course. If, you, if you're if you interested in the parting, the history of the parting of the ways, excellent course, folks. Some of you read, uh, read my book, The Jewish Gospel of John. This is a course, uh, audio course based on that. We have uh, absolutely unbelievable courses with the stories of Jewish Christ. 
the book of Revelation in Jewish context. The, the amount of uh, uh, courses that are available for, for you to pick and begin is astounding. Now, here's another thing most people actually don't know about, the interviews. We call them, and we used to call them, round table talks. Now, for those of you who are more serious, advanced um, uh, scholars that are present today, and by the way, I welcome all those who will be listening to this uh, conference in the video recording as well. Actually, most people will be um, will be listening in the video recording. Um, some of you who know, and some of you would know who these people are. These people are the world class scholars. For example, Robert Alter uh, from UC Berkeley. And some of you might say, "Is there anything good that might come from from uh, Berkeley?" Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, of course. Um, uh, Robert Walter, one of the greatest biblical scholars of today, um, he just finished an excellent, excellent translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, a very unique. If you want to get an excellent translation of the Hebrew Bible, look it up on Amazon. Robert Walter, one of the greatest uh, Jewish scholars of the Bible, Professor Paula Fredrickson, Emmy Jill Levine, um, you name it, we've got it. Uh, these are interviews where we, our faculty, get to speak with all of these great men and women, the scholars in the university, in the university levels, with 30, 40 books behind their belt. Um, so it's, we, we have provided this as part of the program that is very, very important to accompany the courses that we have. Now, uh, also it's very important to realize that you can click here on the just released and upcoming courses, meaning that new studies are added all the time. In other words, this is not just an old collection that you can sign up and that's it. We, we're providing constantly new courses all the time. This is, folks, an excellent course I keep reading um, students' comments on this, and they're just beyond positive. The, the Psalms of David, the Hebrew approach to God by Dr. Nicholas Scheiser. This is an incredible, incredible course. Um, and uh, uh, you can also look at uh, uh, Dr. Scheiser Gruber's course, Exploring Jewish Interpretation. You know, I jokingly say that the Shai Gruber is, is the smartest on our staff because I think he has four postdoctorates. Okay, it's just really, really incredible guy. Um, take a look at the upcoming courses: Introduction to Jewish Prayer. I'm recording this course right now, this month. Uh, Stories of the Jewish Jewish uh, Church too. In Kashir is recording this. Nicholas Scheiser is recording now. Uh, Jewish Gospels of Matthew, this Revelation, one of the follow-up courses on Revelation, Shofar Call Revelation. This name may or may not stay there, but this is the this is the new course on the Revelation that gives you the Revelation in Jewish context, the broad picture from the very beginning to the end, to see all of those kinds of things. And just uh, folks, the the reason I say, the reason I in all good conscience say that this school, Israel Bible Center, uh, is where much of that um, treasure hidden that you don't see by looking only at tip of the iceberg. It's because I actually know what's part of this program. And today I'm letting you in on what is here. So why should you register at all? This is not a big announcement. By registering to study with us, you will influence your own community, gain further legitimacy in your lay and professional ministry. You will sow into the economy of Israel while at the same time helping to support our work in Muslim majority countries where Christians are persecuted. I cannot tell you where this picture was taken, but you could see me there in the in, in the middle, the, the bold looking handsome guy over there. Uh, these are uh, 
uh, pastors of uh, home congregations in the country that persecutes and harasses them. Right? This time when I came to teach them, they were learning the basis of biblical Hebrew. Folks, if the former Muslim believers can, that are now uh, followers of Christ Jesus, are interested in studying of biblical Hebrew, should this not provoke you to jealousy? Of course it should. And you should remember what the Rabbi Gamaliel said. Say not that I will study when I have the time to study, because you may never have the time to study. So what is in the student corner? So when you register, when you get in the student corner, you upload your picture. It's very easy. You click on it and you, you upload any picture that you want from your computer. You write out if you wish for yourself. Uh, once you select um, which course you want it, actually, they will appear here in this section. Now, it's a little bit like in Netflix. Some of you who are familiar with what Netflix is, whether you like it or don't like it, but we're, we're very much learning as much as we can about providing great service um, to our students. And so uh, we've developed a system where you can start listening. By the way, every section is 15, 20 minutes. So in other words, you could ride a car, you could wash dishes, you can clean your house, you could do, you could do walks. Uh, so all these people are telling me that I don't have time. Uh, I, t frankly, I don't believe it because I, they're not more busy than me, and I'm very busy. And even I can find time to listen to something that's really, really good, that's life-changing, that God wants me to get deep into. I can find the time. It's always the matter of priorities. Now, we displays the kind of things that are just released, the kind of things that, that are uh, that a last watch. Now, this is very, very, very important thing, and most of the people don't know. We have also a section on resources here, and you could read the kind of things that we provide for you here. There are incredible things. Also, they become part of your part of your learning experience, learning program. If you click on the video library, which I can't click here, uh, but you would do this once you register. You will find that here, this is, by the way, uh, a great supporter of Israel Bible Center, Professor Boyarin, also of UC Berkeley. Don't ask, don't ask how come we got two people from UC Berkeley, but he's another terrific, terrific um, person, incredible, incredible teacher. We will have an interview with him, uh, with him soon for you. But when you click here, we, will, we have here enormous collection of other scholars from different universities giving lectures on a variety of topics, all having to do with the Jewish studies relevant to you, modern Christ follower. Now, here's the time for the, of the announcement. So why should I register today? So first reason you should register today is with your registration, for any study plan, you will receive a free digital subscription of Israel Bible Weekly, where members of our academic staff publish short and to the point new research. Folks, it has to be two, three minutes. We're all busy people. We don't have the time, but every day you can open up the, the Israel Bible Weekly and you can find something thought-provoking, inspirational, something life-changing if you that is if you're interested in the jewish studies as related to christ followers today where members of our academic staff publish short and to the point new research in everyday's language allowing for your interactive involvement through questions and comments you will love it i guarantee it now here is a second reason to register today only through a special link we provide, we will provide it a little bit later. I will also send it to you via email. Uh, at this conference, your student account will be credited with unprecedented four, four premium courses, tuition free. Not two courses, four premium courses. So if you've been thinking about possibly joining at some future time, this is the time to do it, and you can only get these four premium courses added to your account 
if you register through a link we will provide for you. And the third reason to register today, you will receive a physical and personally autographed copy of my newest book, The Hidden Story of Jacob. What we can see in Hebrew that we cannot see in English. So those are the three reasons. The Israel Bible Weekly, second reason to register today is four, not two, four free additional courses. And third reason to register today, first 144 students will receive a physical copy, autographed copy of the newest book that's not available anywhere at all yet. The hidden story of Jacob, what we can see in Hebrew that we cannot see in English. Why should you register? By registering to study with us, you will influence your own community, gain further legitimacy in your lay and professional ministry, and you will sow into the economy of Israel, while at the same time helping to support our work in Muslim majority countries where Christians are persecuted. But I will leave this slide open so that you can uh, read it, copy what you'd like to copy, and then go ahead and register. And uh, if we're going to have another conference in the future, I will certainly, we will certainly announce it, okay? But it was pleasure, true pleasure and honor for me to be with you. Thank you so much to Professor Pinfas Shir for helping along with this uh, with this presentation, with this conference. And thank you to everyone who will be watching this conference in recording. Shalom from Israel, and may the Lord keep you and bless you. Bye-bye.